This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie with fifty million reasons why salvation is by faith alone in christ alone by grace alone a sovereign god give faith to man salvation's in the maker's hand this gospel offends rome today they offer up Another way, a counterfeit, a compromise Beware the ancient papal lie With such a cloud of witnesses Who by grace died in their Lord Recall their memory to say By the same faith we live today Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler 66 Hour of the Truth. Today we are going to read the next part in this wonderful monumental work from Philip van Limborg, a Dutch author from 1692, The History of the Inquisition. In case you've wondered, I think I said that already with the last broadcast, the introduction is more than a hundred pages. So, it's going to take us quite a while to go through there. And I try to remember all the links that I put up here, uh, that I looked up to put them into the video while I'm doing so. And I uh, just want to remind you, this video, we are still talking about the introduction. Yeah? It's dealing with the history of the persecution. And the subsection is called of the persecution amongst Christians upon account of religion. And what we are talking today about <coughs> is part four. So maybe you've read that in some of my comments that I've made before uh, on the making of this video. Um, it was impossible for me to upload videos. I, I mean, it was possible, but it took, I don't know, about 10 hours a piece or so. I don't do that. Uh, to upload the video files, the original video files that I made with this desktop camera, Hypercam 2, that I have, AVI files. And when I do an hour of reading, it does about 25 gigabyte. And to upload that on YouTube just takes hours and hours and it's not possible. So I convert them with Video Maker. That's why you have the wonderful Inquisition song in the beginning, which is also very fitting, of course, to this. Uh, to this videos to have that Inquisition song in front of it, of course. And yeah, okay, the quality for the reading is of course a little less. That's why the other one takes uh, <laughs> several gigabytes file to have that very nice of, uh, of a resolution that we cannot have otherwise. So just to inform you about this, 
<clears throat> that uh, these videos will be processed with Video Movie Maker, and you know, it, it's it's about what I say, and it's not about what you see. But you will see at least everything that I read, and you can take your own copy of the book. That's why I present you the download link in the description box of the video so you can download your own PDF file and read along with me for a better understanding if you want to. But okay, without any further ado, let us just go to the document right now, to the book, The History of the Inquisition by Philip van Limburg of 1692, and read on where we left off last time with Emperor Gratian, the son of Valentinian, his partner and successor in the empire, was of the Orthodox party, and after the death of his uncle Valens, recalled those whom he had banished, and restored them to their sees. But as to the Arians, he sent Sepporus, one of his captains, to drive them as wild beasts out of all their churches. Socrates and Sozomen tell us, however, that by a law he obtained that persons of all religions, sh religions should meet without fear in their several search searches and worship according to their own way the um, uh, Eumena, Eumena, Eunomians, sorry, the Eunomians, the Phontesians and the Manichaeans accepted. have <laughs> some strange names. The Eunomians, Phontesians and Manichees accepted. Okay, sorry for if I butchered that word, but you can always do better, I suppose. Now we just read here about Socrates, and uh, that is Socrates of Constantinople. That is not Socrates that you know the Socrates from Greece. And if you want to learn about who he was, I'm going to provide to you a link that is... Um, here on Wikipedia, Socrates of Constantinople, he lived between about 380 AD until after 439 AD. He was also known as Socrates Scholasticus and was a 5th century Christian church historian, a contemporary of Sozomen and Theodoret. Sozomen, we just read in the book also. Okay, He's the author of a Historia Ecclesiastica meaning church history, which covers the history of late ancient Christianity during the years 305 to 439. Meaning, this book covers the history of the ancient Christianity, of that time of Christianity when Christianity was hijacked by the pagan Roman Empire through Constantine, which we already read through, and that was the big falling away that Paul warned us of in the New Testament. And when that falling away had come, then the man of sin would be revealed, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible. And we are in the church history between this great, yeah, you cannot even call it a schism, but this falling away from the time of Emperor Constantine making Christianity the state religion of Rome and the time of the fall of the Roman Empire in 476 and then the rise of the Bishop of Rome as the successor of the pagan emperor who came into full fruition and took the title Pontifex Maximus again in 606 and reigned between 606 and 1866 1260 years and therefore fulfills the prophecy of Daniel the prophecy of John the three and a half years the 42 months the 1260 days the Antichrist and we are now in the preparing part. And also in this preparing part, of course, we learn about the persecution. That's why I'm reading this whole book. This book deals with the persecution of the saints. The saints are Bible-believing, Jesus Christ-following Christians. Yeah? And those have always been persecuted. And how they were persecuted, even in the time of the 3rd and 4th and 5th century, that is what we are reading right now. 
So interesting, I think, is that you see we read of Socrates of Constantinople, and you saw here another page I opened up for you, Vettius Augurius Pretextatus. That is a guy that we were speaking about in the last video, and um, because I didn't know who he was, I looked him up, and I will put, of course, a description box of, the, of him in this, and probably even in the video we did here before, so that you can know that. Vettius Agorius Pretextatus lived between 315 and 384. He was a wealthy pagan aristocrat in the 4th century Roman pagan empire, and he was a high priest in the cults of numerous gods pagan gods, which are no gods. He served as the Praetorian Prefect at the court of Emperor Valentinian II in 384 until his death at the same year. And you can read for yourself who he was, where he came from, what he did in Wikipedia. And of course do other studies, but I will just provide the Wikipedia links because the author mentioned these guys in this book. And then later on we will come to Genseric, but that's not for now, that's for later on. We will have a look at that when the time has come. Up to then, to that time, we will continue reading in our book, The History of the Inquisition. We just got introduced by Socrates, who I just told you, which was Socrates of Constantinople, who was a contemporary of Sozomen, who is mentioned in this name, in this same sentence. And because I butchered the three names here, I try to do that again now in a little better quality for you guys. Socrates and Sozomen tell us, however, that by a law he ordained that performs of all religions should meet without fear in their several churches and worship according to their own way, the Eunomians, Photinians and Manichees accepted. Theodosius, soon after his advancement by Gratian to the empire, discovered a very warm zeal for the orthodox opinions. For observing that the city of Constantinople was divided into different sects, he wrote a letter to them from Thessalonica, wherein he tells them that it was his pleasure that all his subjects should be of the same religion with Damasus, bishop of Rome, and Peter, bishop of Alexandria, and that their church only should be called Catholic, universal, <laughs> that their church only should be called Catholic, who worship the divine trinity as equal in honor, and that those who were of another opinion should be called heretics, become infamous, and be subject to other punishments. Now what we just read is that Theodosius says that any other but the orthodox, yeah, as he calls it here, any other but the orthodox, which is called Catholic, shall be called heretics. Okay? So we have to understand that whenever the author here tells us something about orthodox Christians, he means Catholic Christians. We have to make the distinction between Roman Catholics between Orthodox and between true Apostolic Bible-believing Christians. I would like to call them Apostolic Christians, because Protestantism today actually should be Apostolic Christianity. The Christianity that came out of the Apostles, out of the Book of Acts, after Jesus Christ was crucified, rose up and went to heaven. That apostolic Christianity actually is Protestantism. That's what I adhere to. Apostolic Christianity. Bible-based. True Bible-based. The real, the uncorrupted and only Bible. But we should get familiar with all the terms used. So when he uses the term Orthodox, he means Catholic. And all the others are heretics. And of course you have the Arians who still play a very, very important role. Because I told you, the Arians were most of all the Vandals. And how they ended, you know, when you looked into or followed my videos of characteristics of Antichrist. Three horns were plucked out by the root. The Ostrogoths, the Heruli, 
and the Vandals. The Vandals being the Aryans that we are reading all about this dispute, this schism here in the 4th and the 5th coming century that we are talking about here. Okay? So, anything else, they should, uh, uh, Orthodox should be called Catholics and anything else shall be, should be called heretics. Heretics, like they called all through the ages apostolic Christians. But let's continue. He also forbid assemblies and disputations in the forum. Now, the forum was an assembly hall at that time of politicians. And made a law for the punishment of those that should presume to argue about the essence and nature of God. Upon his first coming to Constantinople, being very felicitous, uh, um, Felicitous, yeah, for the peace and increase of the church, he sent for uh, Demophilus, the Arian bishop, and asked him whether he would consent to the Nicene faith and thus accept the peace he offered him. Adding, quote, if you refuse to do it, meaning accept the Nicene faith from the Council of Nicaea in 325, I will drive you from your churches, unquote. And upon Demophilus' refusal, the emperor was as good as his word, and turned him and all the Arians out of the city, after they had been in possession of the churches there for forty years. But being willing more effectually to extinguish heresy, he summoned a council of bishops of his own persuasion, in AC 383, to meet together at Constantinople in order to confirm the Nicene Creed, what he just asked of the Arian bishop. The number of them were 150. To there were added 36, <coughs> to there were added 36 of the Macedonian party. And accordingly this council, which had reckoned the second ecumenical or general one, all of them, except the Macedonians, did, did decree that the Nicene faith should be the standard of orthodoxy. Meaning, <coughs> the Nicene faith, the faith put dogma at the Nicene Creed, or the, uh, the, the, the Council of Nicaea, the Nicene Creed, should be the standard of orthodoxy, should be the standard of the Catholic belief system. Yeah? Catholic, as we read here, that standard of orthodoxy is Catholic, and that it is still today. So that was manifested in 383. You can compare this to the Council of Trent in 1545 and the Vatican Council, the Second Vatican Council of uh, the 1960s, where that Second Vatican Council in the 1960s only confirmed everything that was said in the Council of Trent. So here we have the council um, that was called to in 383 at Constantinople just in order to confirm the Nicene faith as I've just read to you. Okay? So that the Nicene faith should be the standard of orthodoxy and that all heresies should be condemned. Baba! There you got the same story. There is nothing new under the sun, people. It always has a precursor. And the precursor of the Second Vatican Council of the 1960s was the Council of Trent. And the precursor of the Council of um, Constantinople that we read here was the Nicene Creed, the very first council called by a Roman emperor after he ordained, after he commanded that quote-unquote Christianity become the religion, the state religion of the pagan Roman Empire. 
They also made an addition to that creed, explaining the orthodox doctrine of the Spirit against Macedonius, meaning, after the words Holy Ghost, they inserted the Lord, the Quickener, proceeding from the Father, whom with the Father and the Son we worship and glorify, and who spake by the prophets. Now what does that mean that they say here? They made an addition to that creed explaining that the orthodox doctrine, the Catholic doctrine of the spirit against the Macedonius, against Macedonius, meaning after the words Holy Ghost, they inserted man, the council inserted after the Holy Ghost, they put the Holy Ghost together with the Lord, with the quickener proceeding from the Father from which the Father and the Son we worship and glorify, and who spake by the prophets. This means here they make their trinity, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, three persons, all equal at the same, meaning all of a sudden that the Holy Ghost is God, with something that is never ever to be found in the Bible. When the council was ended, I, I, I hope you get that, what I'm just reading here to you. When the council was ended, the emperor, instead of giving me all, all these <laughs> negative comments, or not any comments at all, I would love to hear a little comment on this part. Anyway, okay, let, let's continue. When the council was ended, the emperor um, put forth two edicts against heretics, by the first prohibiting them to hold uh, from holding any assemblies, uh, so heretics could not worship according to their creed anymore, uh, by the first prohibiting them to, uh, from holding any assemblies, and by the second forbidding them to meet in fields or villages, ordering the houses where they met to be confiscated, and commanding that such who went to other places to teach their opinions or perform their religious worship, should be forced to return to the places where they dwelt, condemning all those officers and magistrates of cities who should not prevent such assemblies. This, to me, is absolutely early persecution. Yeah? First, prohibiting them from holding any assemblies, and secondly, forbidding them to meet in fields or villages, ordering the houses where they met to be confiscated. D do you know what that reminds me of? That law that was passed in the midst of 2016, last year in Russia, where it stated that it is um, now forbidden in Russia to proselyte outside of the churches, to evangelize outside of the churches. You can look that up. That is a new law, I think, that went effective into, uh, into working in August 2016. Look it up in Russia, where it is forbidden to evangelize outside of the churches. Isn't this what we've just read here about the same, this persecution, that they were banned from preaching in the fields and in the cities, and that the houses where they preached were confiscated? What else is that? There is nothing new under the sun, people. Nothing new under the sun. A little while after the conclusion of this council of uh, Constantinople then, finding that many disorders were still occasioned through the opposition of several parties, uh, to one another, he convened the principal persons of each and ordered them to deliver into his hand a written form of their belief, which, after he had received, he, re, uh, he retired by himself and earnestly prayed to God that he would enable them to, uh, him to make choice of the truth. And when after this he had perused uh, the several papers delivered to him, he tore them all into pieces, except that which contained the doctrine of the indivisible trinity, to which he entirely adhered. You got it? He 
tore all the pieces, all the papers into pieces, tore them all into pieces except that which contained the doctrine of the indivisible trinity, to which he entirely adhered. There is no indivisible trinity in the Bible. After this, he published a law by which he forbid heretics to worship or preach or to ordain bishops or others, commanding some to be banished, others to be rendered infamous and to be deprived of common privileges of citizens with other grievous penalties of the like nature. Sozomen, however, yeah, you know, remember, Sozomen, that historian who lived at the same time of Socrates the historian, Sozomen, however, tells us that he did not put these laws in execution because his intention was not to punish his subjects, but to terrify them into the same opinions of God with himself, praising at the same time those who voluntarily embraced them. Socrates also confirms the same, telling us that he only banished Eunonymus uh, from Constantinople for holding private assemblies and reading his books to them, and thereby corrupting many with his doctrine. But that as to others he gave them no disturbance, nor forced them to communicate with him, but allowed them all their several me meetings and to enjoy their own opinions as to the Christian faith. Some he permitted to build churches without the cities and the novations to retain their churches within because they held the same doctrines with himself. Arcadius and Honorius, the sons and successors of Theodosius, embraced the Orthodox religion and party, remember, the Catholic religion and party, and confirmed all the decrees of the foregoing emperors in their favor. Soon after their accession to the imperial dignity, Nectarius, bishop of Constantinople, died, and John, called for his eloquence, Chrysostom, was ordained in his room, means in his place. He was a person of a very rigid and severe temper, an enemy to heretics and against allowing them any toleration. Gaina, one of the principal officers of Arcadius, and who was a Christian of the Arian persuasion, desired of the emperor one church for himself and those of his opinion within the city. Chrysostom, being informed of it, immediately went to the palace, taking with him all the bishops he confined at Constantinople and in the presence of the emperor bitterly inveighed against Gaina who was himself at the audience and reproached him for his former poverty, as also with insolence and ingratitude. Then he produced the law that was made by Theodosius, by which heretics were forbidden to hold assemblies within the walls of the city, and turning to the emperor persuaded him to keep in force all the laws against heretics, adding that it was better voluntarily to quit the empire than to be guilty of impiety and betraying the house of God. Chrysostom carried his point, and the consequence of it was an insurrection of the Goths in the city of Constantinople, which had liked to have ended in the burning of the imperial palace and the murder of the emperor and did actually end in the cutting off of all the Gothic soldiers and the burning of their church with great numbers of persons in it who fled thither f for safety and were blocked and were locked into, uh, in to prevent their escape. His violent treatment of several bishops and the arbitrary manner of his disposing them and substituting others in their room, meaning their place, contrary to the desires and prayers of the, uh, of the people, is but too full a proof of his imperious temper and love of power. Love of power, not love for the Lord, love of power. Not content with this, he turned his eloquence against the Empress Eudoxia, and in a set oration inveighing against the uh, bad woman, he expressed himself in such a manner as that both his friends and enemies believed that the invective was 
chiefly levelled against her. This so enraged her that she soon procured his disposition and banishment. Being soon after restored, he added new provocations to the former by rebuking the people for certain diversions they took at a place where the statue of the empress was erected. This she took for an insult on her person, and when Chrysostom knew her displeasure on this account, he used more severe expressions against her than before, saying, Herodias is enraged again. She raises fresh disturbances, and again desires the head of John in a charger. Going back to the history of John the Baptist, whose head was desired at a charger or on a silver platter, remember? On this and other accounts he was deposed and banished by a synod, convened for that purpose, bishop, <coughs> bishops being always to be had in those days easily uh, easily to do what, uh, what was desired or demanded of them by the emperors. Chrysostom died in his banishment, according to the Christian wish of Epiphanius. I hope you'll not die a bishop at Constantinople, which Chrysostom returned with, this, uh, with the same good temper, quote, I hope you'll not live to return to your own city. So deadly was the hatred of these saints and fathers against each other. Now, let me go into a little comment here. So strong was the hatred of the saints, the author said. Do saints hate? Who are saints? Saints are apostolic Christians, Bible-believing, Jesus-following Christians. Where did ever Jesus teach hatred? Do you remember a place where Jesus preached hatred? Jesus himself hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. He hates, of course, Satan, that's something else, or the deeds of Satan. But Jesus never hated any person. And he never taught to hate someone. No, he even said, pray for them who persecute you. Do good on them who persecute you. Love your enemy. That's what he said. Jesus never taught any hatred. And here with this interesting sentence between these two bishops, yeah, we can see that when Chrysostom died in his banishment, according to the Christian wish of Epiphanius, I hope you'll not die bishop of Constantinople, which Chrysostom returned <coughs> with this of the same temper, I hope you'll not live to return to your own city. So deadly was the hatred of these saints and fathers against each other. The author, of course, uses the word fathers because this is so used in the Orthodox or Catholic Church history. Call no one your father, but one is your father who is in heaven. Okay? So deadly was the hatred of these saints, I happen to disagree. When they hated, they could not have been saints. They could not have been apostolic Christians. But of course the author is just trying to make a point, but so am I. So please forgive me that I ride on this beast. I want to make that point. So deadly was the hatred of these saints and fathers against each other, I understand, but by that they were not saints, and of course they were no fathers. But I don't want to hang up on this point because, you know, <laughs> this whole book is full of points like this. Otherwise, it takes even double the time it should take anyway. After Chrysostom's death, his favorers and friends were treated with great severity, not indeed on the account of religion, but for other crimes of sedition they were charged with. 
and particularly for burning down one of the churches in the city, the flames of which spread themselves to the Senate House and entirely consumed it. Oops, we just wanted to burn the church, we didn't want to burn the Senate, but yeah, you know, banger. And the same emperors, the Donatists, gave sad specimens of their cruelty in Africa towards the Orthodox, as St. Austin informs us. They seized on Maximinus, one of the African bishops, as he was standing at the altar, beat him unmercifully, and ran a sword into his body, leaving him for dead. And a little after he adds that it would be tedious to recount the many horrible things they made the bishops and clergy suffer, some had their eyes put out, one bishop has had his hands and tongue cut off, and others were cruelly destroyed. I forbear, says Austin, to mention their barbarous murders, murders and demolishing of houses, not private ones only, but the very churches themselves. And people think that something like um, in 1938, the pogrom night with the burning of the synagogues in Germany has never happened before. Who lit the fires here? Yeah? The fires of houses, and not only houses, but the very churches themselves. Honorius published very severe edicts against them, ordaining that if they did not, both clergy and laity return to the Catholics by such a day, they should be heavily fined, their estates should be confiscated, the clergy banished, and their churches all given to the Catholics. <laughs> This is exactly what happened during the whole time of the Inquisition, the whole time of the persecution of apostolic Christians all through the centuries. And here you see the starting of it. If you do not return to the Catholic faith by such a day, meaning directly, they should be heavily fined, taking their money away, their estates should be confiscated, all their possessions are being taken by the state, and the clergy banished, all the priests put in prison, the pastors put into prison, and their churches all given to the Catholics. This is exactly what happens today in the world, but you guys just don't see it. These laws... Austin commands as rightly and piously ordained, maintaining the lawfulness of persecuting heretics by all manner of ways, death only excepted. So you could persecute them any way you want, but just not kill them. Under the reign of Theodosius, Arcadius his son, those, were, uh, those who were called heretics were grievously persecuted by the Orthodox meaning the Catholics. Theodosius, Theodosius, bishop of Senada in Phrygia, expelled great numbers of the followers of Macedonius from the city and country round about, not from any zeal for the true faith, as Socrates says, but through covetousness and a design to extort money from them. On this account he used all his endeavors to oppress them, and particularly Agapetus, their bishop, armed his clergy against them and accused them before the tribunal of the judges. And because he did not think the governors of the provinces sufficient to carry on his good work of persecution, he went to Constantinople to procure fresh edicts against them. <laughs> but by this means but by this means he lost his bishopric the people refusing him admission into the church upon his return and choosing agapetus whom he had persecuted in his room in his state okay instead of 
means this old English expression, which you probably understand better than I do. <laughs> Theophilus, Bishop of Alexandria, the great enemy of Chrysostom, being dead, Cyril was enthroned in his room, not without great disturbance and opposition of, from the people, and used his power for the oppression of heretics. For immediately upon his advancement he shut up all the churches of the Novatians in that city, took away all their sacred treasures, and stripped Theo, uh, Theopemptus, their bishop, of everything that he had. Nor was this much to be wondered at, since at Socrates observes that from the times of Theophilus, Cyril's predecessor, the bishop of Alexandria, began to assume an authority and power above what belonged to the second total order. Oh, ho, ho, ho. What, 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 what did we just read here? Socrates observes that from the time of Theophilus, Cyril's predecessor, the bishop of Alexandria began to assume an authority and power above what belonged to the second total order. Meaning, he took to himself next to the spiritual power, quote unquote, which is the second total order, which, which is the power that belongs to the second total order. He took it upon himself to also have temporal power, the civil power. How else can you understand this sentence? The Bishop of Alexandria began to assume an authority and power above what belonged to the second total order. Now, what is the power that belongs to the second total order? That is spiritual power. And when I assume an authority and power above what belonged to the second total order, that can only mean that he assumed temporal power also. The melting of state and church. On this account, the author continues, the great men hated the bishops because they usurped to themselves a good part of that power which belonged to the imperial governors of provinces. And particularly, Cyril was hated by Orestes, prefect of Alexandria, not only for, his, for this reason, but because he was a continual spy upon his actions. So within the next sentence we get a confirmation that I understood and explained to you the sentence before quite correctly. At length their hatred to each other was publicly appeared. Cyril took on him without acquainting the governor, or contrary to, this, to his leave, to deprive the Jews of all their synagogues, and banished them from the city, and encouraged the mob to plunder them of their effects. <laughs> Should I read this again, or did you understand what you've just heard? Cyril, let's call him Adolf Hitler, took on him without acquainting the governor, or contrary to his leave, to deprive the Jews of all their synagogues and banish them from the city and encouraged the mob to plunder them of their effects. The same that Adolf Hitler did so many years later. And that's why Adolf Hitler said, which we can read in um, The Secret History of the Jesuits from Edmond Paris, a quote that Adolf Hitler said, I'm just doing what the Roman Catholic Church did for 1500 years, only more effective. Cyril took on him to deprive the Jews of all their synagogues and banished them from the city, and encouraged them up to plunder them of their effects. Now, do you think that they just plundered the belongings of the Jews, or that they also got the right, probably, to even kill the Jews? Hmm? What do you think? This, the author continues, 
This the pre prefect highly resented and refused the bishop's offers and peace a friendship. Upon this about fifty monks came into the city for Cyril's defense. So when the prefect doesn't like it, Cyril sends monks. And these fifty monks were meeting that the prefect and his chariot and publicly insulted him, calling him sacrificer and pagan, the pot calling the kettle black, adding many other injurious reproaches. One of the monks, called Ammonius, wounded him in the head with a stone, which he flung at him with great violence and covered him all over with blood, and being, according to the laws, put by Orestes publicly to the torture, he died through the severity of it. St. Cyril honorably received the body into the church, gave him the new name of Thomasius, the, or the Wonderful, ordered him to be looked on as a martyr, and lavishly extolled him in the church as a person murdered for his religion. This scandalous procedure of Cyril's the Christians themselves were ashamed of, because it was publicly known that the monk was punished for his insolence, and even St. Cyril himself had the modesty at last to use his endeavors that the whole affair might be entirely forgotten. The murder also of Hypatia by Cyril's friends and clergy, merely out of envy to her superior skills in, Philadelphia, in philosophy, brought him and his church of Alexandria under great infamy. For as he was returning, as she was returning uh, uh, home from a visit, one Peter, a clergyman, with some other murders, seized on her, dragged her out of her chariot, carried her to one of the churches, stripped her naked, scraped her to death with shells, then tore her into pieces and burnt her body to ashes. Innocent also, Bishop of Rome, grievously persecuted the Novatians and took from them many churches and, as Socrates observes, was the first bishop of that see who disturbed them. Celestine also, one of his successors, uh, imitated this injustice and took from the Novatians the remainder of their churches and forced them to hold their assemblies in private. For the bishops of Rome, as well as those of Alexandria, had usurped a tyrannical power, which, as priests, they had no right to, and would not suffer those who agreed with them in the faith, as the Novatians did, to hold public assemblies, but drove them out of their oratories and plundered them of all their substance. Now what do we see here with Celestine? What do we see here with the Bishop of Rome that we read here, as well as those, means the Bishop of Alexandria, they had observed, observed a tyrannical power, which as priests they had no right to. Usurpation is what the Pope of today gave the power that he means to have. Actually, the Pope has no power. If tomorrow nobody listens to him anymore, he's just a man like you and me. But problem is, people are so stupid, they want to listen to him. Because they actually <laughs> are listening to the fallen spirits, to the fallen angels, the demons, the ministers of Satan. The bishops of Rome, as well as those of Alexandria, had usurped a tyrannical power which, as priests, as priest, they had no right to. The Pope has also no right to any other power but the spiritual, if any power at all. I deny him any power at all, but even give him the spiritual, he does not have the right to the temporal power also. And here we see already the startings of this Let's call it the falling away. Nestorius, who was bishop at Constantinople, immediately upon his advancement, showed himself a violent persecutor. For as soon as ever he was ordained, 
he addressed himself to the emperor before the whole congregation and said, quote, Purge me, O emperor, the earth from heretics, and I will give thee in recompense the kingdom of heaven. Conquer with me the heretics, and I with thee will subdue the Persians. And agreeable to his bloody wishes, the fifth day after his consecration, he endeavored to demolish the church of the Arians in which they were privately assembled for prayer. The Arians in their rage, seeing the destruction of it determined, set fire to it themselves and occasioned the burning down of their neighboring houses. And for this reason not only the heretics, but those of his own persuasion, distinguished him by the name of incendiary. But he did not rest here, but tried all tricks and methods to destroy the heretics, and by these means endangered the subversion of Constantinople itself. He persecuted the Novatians through the hatred of uh, through hatred of Paul, their bishop, for his eminent piety. He grievously oppressed those who were not uh, orthodox, meaning Catholic. He grievously oppressed those who were not Catholic as to the day of keeping Easter in Asia, Lydia and Caria, and occasioned the murderers, the murders of great numbers on this account at Miletus and Sardis. Few indeed of the bishops were free from this wicked spirit. Socrates, however, tells us that Atticus, bishop of Constantinople, Constantinople, was a person of great piety and prudence, and that he did not offer violence to any of the heretics, but that after he had once attempted to terrify them, he behaved more mildly and gently to them afterwards. Proclus also, bishop of the same city who had even brought under, uh, up under Atticus, was a careful imitator of his piety and virtue, and exercised rather greater moderation than, this, than his master, being gentle towards all men from a pers uh, persuasion that this was much more a proper method than violence to reduce heretics to the true faith, and therefore he never made it use uh, of the imperial power for this purpose. Now, this is a nice sentence that we should read again to understand it. Proclus was a bishop of the same city, meaning Constantinople. Proclus, bishop of Constantinople, who had been brought up under Atticus, was a careful imitator of his piety and virtue, meaning the piety and virtue of Atticus, and exercised rather greater moderation than his master, being gentle towards all men, from a persuasion that this was a much more proper method than violence to reduce heretics to the true faith, and therefore he never made use of the imperial power for this purpose. I think that we here found a bishop with Proclus, we found a bishop who really put the preaching and teaching of Jesus Christ into his own teaching, into his own doing, because he said that he was persuaded by that, uh, he was uh, much more moderate and being gentle towards all men, that that was a much more proper method than violence to reduce heretics to the true faith, and therefore he never made use of the imperial power for this purpose. This is exactly what we apostolic Christians should do. We should use the word of God. We should take our Bible, huh? as Jesus said, take up the sword, and our sword, two-edged sword, is the Bible, the King James 1611 in English, and we should talk to people about Jesus Christ and talk to people about the truth, not in anger, not with violence, but with love and compassion and charity, as it is preached in the Bible. That's what we should do, and that's what 
Proclus, Bishop of Constantinople here did, at least at this time. And in doing this, the author continues, he imitated Theodosius, the emperor, who was not at all concerned or displeased that any should think differently of God from himself. However, the number of bishops of this temper was but small. That is the problem. People who understood the teaching of Jesus Christ the teaching of non-violence, of love, of charity, the ones who understand what the kingdom of God actually stands for, the number of those bishops in this temper was but small. Nothing pleased the generality of them but methods of severity and the utter ruin and extirpation of their adversaries. So it's only a small number that has pleasure in dealing peacefully with so-called heretics, people of other beliefs, and discussing and debating with them, and the general population of bishops and, and clergy people at that time, nothing pleased the generality of them more but methods of severity meaning the utter ruin and extirpation of their adversaries. Under the reign of this emperor, the Arians also in their turn used the Orthodox with no greater moderation than the Orthodox has used them. The Vandals, who were partly pagans and partly Arians, had seized on Spain and Africa and exercised innumerable cruelties on those who were not of the same religion with themselves. You see, it is, it is not easy to say, oh, the Vandals, they were fine people and they were extirpated because they were against Rome, so they were all good. No, they were not all good. They were partly pagans and partly Arians. Uh, what does the Bible say about pagans mixing with um, I mean, mixing the holy with the profane, even when Arians, of course, are not a biblical uh, or apostolic Christians, because Arians have a man-centered gospel and not a Christ-centered gospel. But you know, it's it's paying back with with, with, with the same weapons. The Vandals, the author says here, who were partly pagans and partly Arians, had seized on Spain and Africa and exercised innumerable cruelties on those who were not of the same religion with themselves. So, we are talking about religious persecution. Something, of course, this whole book is all about. Religious persecution, even from the Vandals, who were partly pagans and partly, quote-unquote, Christians, Arians. Tresimond, which was the Vandals' general in Spain, and uh, Genseric in Africa, used all possible endeavors to propagate Arianism throughout all their provinces. Now, who was uh, Genseric? And therefore, I told you, I prepared this link in, the, uh, in Wikipedia, where you can read that Genseric or more often referred to as Geyseric, or sometimes Geyseric, who lived between about 389 AD until the end of 477, which is very interesting because that means that he actually lived through the fall of the Roman Empire in 476. This Genseric was king of the Vandals and Aelans. Yeah? And we just read in our book here from the history of the Inquisition, that Trasimond was the general in Spain and Genseric was, as we can read here in Wikipedia, he was the king of the Vandals and Alans, who established the Vandal kingdom and was one of the key players in the troubles of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century. During his nearly 50 years of rule, he raised a relatively insignificant Germanic tribe to the status of a major Mediterranean power. Now, 
this is something that somebody who is interested in can go study a little bit more if you find anything on it because you know of the vandals you will not find any much more because they were plucked up by the roots but this is something intriguing and interesting during his nearly 50 years of rule he raised a relatively insignificant but what german germanic tribe to the status of a major Mediterranean power. Aha! After he died, they entered a swift decline and eventual collapse. Those were Germans, a Germanic tribe, who were not Catholic from the beginning. But after he died, they entered a swift decline and eventual collapse means nothing of them is remaining and that's exactly as the bible said because they were plucked up by the roots this is dealing with gen Zarek, and i just wanted to make that little explanation so that you understand that when we speak of these names that i also try to look them up at least when i have the time to read the book a, a, a little bit in advance before I do my recorded reading like I'm doing here today. Okay, we are approaching the hour, so I will just finish with this paragraph and then we will continue next time with the reading. Trasimund, their general in Spain of the Vandals, and Genesaric in Africa, who was the emperor, as we just uh, read, used all possible endeavors to propagate Arianism throughout all their provinces. And the more effectually to accomplish this design, they filled all places with slaughter and blood by the advice of the bishops of their party, meaning the Arian party, burning down churches and putting the Orthodox, meaning Catholic clergy, to the most grievous and unheard of tortures, to make them discover the gold and silver of their churches, repeating these kind of tortures several times, so that many actually died under them. Genseric seized on all the uh, all the sac uh, seized on all the sacred books he couldn't find he could find. Okay, again that sentence because it's very easy. I just butchered it. Genseric seized on all the sacred books he could find that they might be deprived of the means of defending their opinions. By the counsel of uh, of his bishops, he ordered that none but Arians should be admitted to court or employed in any office about his children, or so much as, in, uh, as enjoyed the benefit of a toleration. Armogestis, Masculine and Satarus, three officers of his court, were inhumanely tortured to make them embrace Arianism, and, upon their refusal, they were stripped of their honors and estates and forced to protract, uh, to protract a miserable life in the utmost poverty and want. These and many more instances of Genseric's cruelty towards the Orthodox during a long reign of 38 years are related by Victor in sign. So, we are going to continue with this paragraph on page 45 in the book the history of the inquisition next time when we come to a reading and i hope that you liked my reading i'm getting more and more into it and getting more and more used to the s and the f's and <laughs> the old english words which of course i can i, I can imagine you can understand it's not easy for a uh, a person who has German as his mother tongue and is not a native English speaker to read these old English in this book. But I enjoy it very much. I learn very much. I hope you do too. And I'm looking forward to reading your comments, at least the ones that deal with this book and what I'm reading here. And, you know, every comment that deserves an answer will get an answer. So, until next time. Juggler 66 from Hour of the Truth signing off says God bless you and bye bye.